So as I said, today is Father's Day. And we can't go, with, I think, today without having a lesson, or at least I can't, that really looks at fathers, in this case, at men in general. Now, this topic of what makes, what makes a man? It's an interesting question. If you will, go ahead and open up 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We'll be there in just a second. As we look and explore this topic and question of what makes a man? Well, I'll say this. I think we can all agree that our modern media, entertainment, is a bit aggressive. When they find something they don't like or they want to, to mess with or poke at, they'll do it hard and they won't relent. And over the last 30 plus years, there's really been one group who's been singled out more than anybody else. And that's the father figure. That father figure is constantly being attacked, torn down, made to seem as a fool, or he does not know what's coming up. And it's really affected our current generations. We see what we would call current father figures. Our grandfathers, these men who went as young men to do a noble and honorable thing, to give themselves up for a greater good, to fight against this evil. We see that modern man, or that, that man, but now we look at this. Now this is what's considered one of the examples of men. This comes from a meme that says, look at the old grandfather picture, and this is a cool picture of this. Go forward 70 or 80 years, and hey, look, I found a picture of your grandfather. This is what the modern man is looking like, someone who's no longer doing things for other people, but is kind of childish, silly, likes to do things that aren't quite so serious, and has put a large burden upon our young people and a couple of these coming generations because we've lost track and focus of what it means to be a man. Of course, then there are those who, who go so far against this image that you see up there, that they kind of swung the pendulum the correct other way. And you get a picture like this of someone who's burly, an outdoorsman, who spends his time out in the woods doing the things that classical men do. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying what the other, the other picture is wrong. But they're both extremes. They're both extremes to counteract what society is saying men should be. But the Bible gives us a very clear description, a very clear picture of what a man of God and a man after God's own heart looks like. And it's the shepherd. He's a man who's, who's selfless, who's caring, who's kind, who's patient, who looks out for others, is an is a important leader, who takes care of the responsibilities he's been given. And then it gives us that even better picture as Jesus. Jesus, the loving shepherd of what a man should really look like is Jesus. He's that happy medium of all of these things coming together. He is what a good, godly man should look like. And then Paul even goes a little bit further, because humanity really likes instructions. We really do like black and white, knowing what to do and what to say. And Paul gives us some four basic principles, I think, of what a Christian man should look like. Read with me in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting in verse 13. He says, Be on the alert. Stand firm in faith. Act like a man. Be strong. And let all you do be done in love. Four basic instructions that we're going to look at this morning of what it is to be a man. We're going to spend this time in kind of in comparison as well. We're going to look at a man, a father figure who failed at that example and then turn back and look at Jesus and how he really emulates that characteristic. So the first is to be alert. What does it mean to be alert? Well, we think we know it's, it's a word that means to be vigilant, to be aware, to be a sentry, a guard. 
In fact, you see that in the, in the animal kingdom. You see on the savannah, herds of animals working together to being these, this vigilant, being aware, to be centuries. Think of a meerkat. I've talked about him before. Wonderful examples of things. They pick one to stand above the rest, to spend all of his time watching, looking out for the dangers that would affect everybody else. And they know when he makes that call to run, they're going to respect that. They run, they move, they get away from the danger. They stand alert. All of them stand alert because of the examples that's given to them from their previous generations. So what's one example here of someone who failed? Think about David. Think about David and his family and what happened there. It really all begins back in 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10. I'm not going to do readings with this. It's a lot of readings for all. But we're going to be summarizing. But it starts back, actually, excuse me, it's in 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 with Bathsheba. As David's example for his family has really begun to falter. As he has failed to be alert for all this that's happening. He's failing to be alert of his example for his kids and his family. He's showing his kids he does not respect what others have that is not for his to take. And then he goes on to fail to show the example of the importance of life. Of how a good leader respects life, other people's lives, and the things that he has to be doing. He fails to do this, and then look what happens to his kids and the troubles that happen to his family with Amnon and Tamar. As Amnon goes and takes what he has no business taking from his sister, his sister. And what does David do in that situation? It says he gets angry and it stops there. David has no other actions than after he's told he gets angry. He failed to show his son what it means to be a protector of the valuable things. He fails Tamar in being that sentry for her. He fails being that special guard for her to protect her from all of these negative influences in her life. And then with Absalom, as he now comes in, failing to, to respect life, decides to take revenge and the, the, the consequences into his own hand, and ends up killing his brother Amnon. David did not do any service for his children in that. And then he continued to fail Absalom. As Absalom then later on decides, I can do things better than, than my father. I'm going to rule. Usurps the throne, runs David out of town, again, failing to respect what was others, takes one of David's concubines, and in front of the entire nation, again, up on the same roof that David failed the nation on, takes what was, had no business of his, or takes something that he had no business of, and fails again and again and again. David failed to be alert with his own family. He was a great king, a mighty king, when we're told is after God's own heart. But David as a father kind of misses the mark just a little bit. But Jesus, Jesus stands alert. Jesus did a couple of different things throughout his time here that makes him stand alert for us. The first is this, that Jesus was always aware of his enemies' intentions. He had that ability to see their hearts, know what was on their minds, but he always was ready to give back that counter, counter defense to when they come in to attack him, to try to rip him down and tear him down, he's always ready, standing guard for himself. And then he's also alert, standing ready of the people's needs. 
Think about the stories of him feeding the 5,000, where the apostles have come to him and said, Jesus, you've got this big crowd around you. It's getting close to dinner time. It's getting time for them to go. Send them away. We can't do anything for them. Jesus, knowing their needs, says, don't send them to the villages. Stay here, and we'll provide. I'll provide for them. Think of the parables, the stories he gives for them. They are not high-level stories that the Pharisees would be the only ones understanding and gaining insight from. He tells them stories and parables, lessons from their level, from their perspective, their points of view. He is aware. He's alert of their needs and what his people that are around him are looking for. Be alert. Stand alert, ever vigilant and ready to guard for all of those around you. The second is be firm in faith or be firm in your faith. It means be grounded. Be grounded, stand strong. In martial arts, they instruct instruct you and teach you to have stances, to be grounded. If you do not have a strong stance, if someone comes at you, they're going to be able to push you you around, push you away, and make you end up on the the back foot of things. Instead, be strong, be grounded, be, be firm in what you're doing. Be firm in your faith. Another way to say this might be, have it bound on your heart and on your mind. Keep it near you. Keep it with you. One who fails in this is King Saul. King Saul really failed to be firm in his faith. He starts out on a high note. He is going well for the Lord and what the Lord is commanding him to do. And all things go well as long as Samuel is by his side. But then Samuel doesn't show. Samuel takes a little bit too long to get there as they get ready to go fight the Philistines. And the people begin to falter. The people begin to fear because Saul is beginning to fear and show some concern. And as the people begin to leave, Saul says, hold on, I need to take things into my own hands. And he sets up an altar. And he makes sacrifice on behalf of the people to God, asking for his protection, for to give them victory in battle. And we see what happens when Samuel finally appears in 1 Samuel chapter 13. In 1 Samuel chapter 13. Starting in verse 7, he says, Some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan of the land of Gad and Gilead, but as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal. And the people followed him, trembling. Now he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel, but he did not come to Gilgal, and the people began to scatter. So Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered that burnt offering. And as soon as he finished offering it, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went to meet him and to greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come on the appointed day, and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. Therefore I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me here, and I have not asked for favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. Now for the Lord would have established your kingdom of Israel forever. Saul was weak in his faith that day. And it costs him everything. It cost him his kingdom. It cost him his family to the point where there's only one descendant left. Because he was weak that day, it cost him everything. Or it happens a little later in sparing the spoils when he goes to the Amalek, this nation of Amalek with the Amalekites. He spares them against what God has said. God said, destroy them all. And when Samuel comes to him again and says, what is that I hear? What is that I hear in the distance? Is that not the mooing of cows, the braying of sheep? 
Saul says, well, the people, the people wanted to keep these things so that we could sacrifice to the Lord. Again, failing to stand firm in his faith. He falters. It costs him everything. Look at how Jesus stands firm in his faith, though. Turn over to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. We're very familiar with this story. It's the temptation of Jesus. As Jesus has now been has been baptized, the Lord has shown and said, this is my beloved Son. He goes out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted and tried by Satan. For him to stand firm in his faith and knowing what was right for him. He keeps his faith, his love for his Father, his love for the truth right there on his heart and on his mind. As every time Satan comes to him, upping the ante, upping the reward, saying, just bow to me, give in, and this will all be yours. Getting to the point where he even offers the world, the physical world, on a silver platter for Jesus. Take all the, what's coming, the pain, the agony, take it all away. Jesus says, no, that can't happen. He says, you should not put the Lord to the test. Jesus stands firm in his faith, firm in his instructions, firm in what he knows is true and what is right. Men, if we want to stay strong and be good godly men, we stand firm in our faith. Because so many watch for that example. Well, then it says, act like men. That's where we come from this. The New King James says, be brave. Be like men, what a man would be. He's brave, ready to stand in times of battle. And then he says, be strong. Be strong. Be prepared. Be built. Be tough. If you want to build strength, physical strength, when you go to the gym, what do you do? You do two specific things. One, you first lift, begin to lift a lot of heavy weights to build mass. But that's not enough. To get true strength, to get lasting strength, as soon as you get that mass, then you switch. And you move to a regimen of toning, of making yourself lean, making your muscles tight, ready to be used for all things. Be prepared, making sure you're ready to stand firm in your faith, making sure you're ready to be alert. That's what being strong here is. Great example of someone failing to be strong is King Ahaz. King Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7 stands surrounded on all fronts. The nation of Israel from the north, Edom from the east, Midian from the south, the Philistines from the west, everybody's coming in and wants their peace of the Judah pie. They want that little piece of this beautiful, wonderful land that the God had set aside for his people. And he begins to fear. And instead of going to the Lord as he should have, as his grandfather Uzziah left a great example for him to stand with the Lord, instead he turns further east. And Ahaz thinks, if I am afraid and fear in this, maybe I should bring the fear to them as he reaches out to Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria. These bloody, awful, murderous marauders. This nation that in our history is known as probably one of the most vilest, evil nations. Calls for them to come protect. And not only does he make that call, he sends tribute to them. Not just from the nation's treasury, not just from his own pockets. He goes to the temple of the Lord. And he takes all of the gold off the walls, all of the gold utensils, all of the silver, takes it, strips it down, sends it all to Assyria, saying, come help us. Stand with us and we will become your vassal nation. We will become your servants. Not standing strong in the Lord, but standing strong in men. And in chapter 7, Isaiah comes to Ahaz as he's beginning to do all of this and says, 
please do not do this. The Lord through me is saying, trust in me. Stand in me. I will protect you. I will protect this nation if you only will ask. In fact, God says, put me to the test. Ask of me one thing, and I will do it to show you that I am on your side. And Ahaz says, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. I don't trust in him. I can't put my trust in him. I'm going to stand strong in what I do know, what I can grasp. And that's on fear. And the nation suffers. The nation suffers for over 20 years under the thumb of Assyria. Not just from the tribute they have to send. Not just from losing their army and many of their men. But from all the evil of the foreign gods that have come in. That invade the temple of the Lord. And just make Hezekiah, the next coming king, his life so difficult to try to overcome all these awful things. Ahaz fails to stand strong and set that example for his son, Hezekiah, who does become strong in the Lord. But Jesus, Jesus is strong. He shows such great strength. Go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what's coming in just a few short hours. The sacrifice he's going to have to make, the pain that's coming, the beatings, the flaying, being put on the cross. As he sits and he prays to his Father to give him strength. As he prays to be with him. To help Jesus continue down the path of his proper will. And then think about his actions as he's in court with the Judean leaders. He sits there and takes their abuse, giving them nothing back, standing strong in what he knows he has to do, standing before Pilate, standing strong in what he knows he has to do, and hangs upon the cross, hanging strong, and pain and suffering because he knows what he has to do for his people, the people of the world, so that we can have the relationship we have with God. Jesus stood strong when anyone else in the world would have faltered and failed. He stood strong because he had to stand strong. Because a man of God has to stand strong. Stand strong. And the last characteristic is probably the most important, but yet hardest one, I think, for for men to show, and it's because of cultural stigmas. Because being loving is not seen as a manly quality. The other ones we've seen to be alert, being firm, being strong, those are what culture does say, this is what a man should be like. This is what partially defines what a man is. But then they look over this most important characteristic of being, loving, being, love. God shows us throughout, over and over again, how important love is, even to the point Where Paul says, among faith, hope, and love, the most important is love. Love is everything to us. And I can only imagine what Joseph's life must have been like if his father had shown love, that same love he showed to him to his older brothers. Think about this situation here. The older boys have done all that their father has asked of them. They're out tending the flocks. They're out standing strong for the family, defending the family after horrible things have happened to their sister. And yet, what does Israel do? He dotes ever so much on Joseph. Pours all of his love and effort into Joseph. 
setting him up as the special chosen one. How would that make you feel as one of the older ten? If your mother and father took one of your other siblings and gave them everything, all of their attention, gave them all of the blessings, all of the, the toys and things you could, they could ever want, gives them all to them, and you sit there with really, truly, nothing. You don't have anything. These boys are seeking. They're seeking just a portion of their father's love. And if Israel had just shown a little bit of that same love towards them, I don't think Joseph would have spent a minute in that pit. He would never have been sold into slavery. He would never have ended up thousands of miles from home. If Israel had shown that same love for his older boys, he might not have suffered for decades thinking that this most treasured child of his, everything he put into this boy, was for nothing, was gone. He suffered for so many years because he put all of that love into one person. And failing to see, he had ten wonderful boys around him as well. But Jesus, Jesus is love. We said earlier and looked at how Jesus was aware of the needs of his people. Look at that same thing. He shows pity and love and care for the people that follow after him. That is love. Even though he knows what's coming up, the people are going to stand against him. They're going to put him on a cross. He still shows such great love for them. Look at how he reacts when Lazarus dies. He weeps. Son of God, the Savior of the world, he cries and he weeps because somebody he cares about deeply is gone. Even though he knows he's about to bring him back, he is still overwhelmed with emotions because Jesus loves. He shows such wonderful love. Think of the love that he shows for all of us. He gave up everything. He gave up heaven for a time. He gave up the chance to be human on earth with us. And he faced all that pain and suffering and agony upon the cross for us. For us, a people who are willingly, who willingly go and separate ourselves from him and the Father. No matter all of that, he still shows such great love for the world. Jesus is a wonderful example of love. These four characteristics not only make for a great man, a godly man, but they make examples of what a father, a father should be. This is the formula for a good father. Good fathers live all of these examples. They show their children the importance of being alert, of being ready to stand and defend. They show their faith to their children. How to have a faith in God. So their children aren't basing their faith upon their father's faith, their own. He shows them how to have your own faith to stand for the Lord. He shows them what it looks like to be strong when the world is fighting back against you and pushing back, saying that you are wrong for believing in these, these archaic things, these things that go against culture. He shows his children we stand strong in the Lord. And the Father, a good Father, shows what real love and sacrifice is to his children by giving them everything they need, providing for them every day, showing them what true love really looks like, what selfless love looks like. 
And good fathers, they look to the greatest father of all. And they stand ready to be in his example. This is what makes for a godly father. While this lesson has mainly been targeted at men, ladies, they have an important challenge for you. I hope you've been paying attention because we need your help. We need your help because you don't think like we do. You see things differently than men do. Sometimes we can't see when we're failing in one of these characteristics. And when you do see this happening from somebody you love, somebody that you want to have as an example for your children and the people that you love, Talk to them. Share with them. Share with us. We need you. That's why you're giving us helpmates to us and we're to you. You help us along this path. Please, I beg of you, help us as men to be emulating these characteristics. And men, it's up to us to not let our defenses get up when we need a little bit of encouragement and a little direction and guidance to help us get back on to what Paul says is the true path of manhood. We've talked about what it looks like to be a good man, to be a man after God, to be emulating the Father. And if you're ready, if you're ready to continue down that path to emulate the Father, to be in His house, to be one of His children, to stand like He does, to show the love and care the Lord shows to us. We ask you, please come forward now as we stand and as we sing.